Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Amateur Radio General Class, session number eight. During our previous class, we looked at the usual Q&A at the start. We had a review of the relevant question pool questions from the previous theory class. And we went into the slide deck, had a look at transistors, uh, vacuum tubes, in particular the triode. We discussed two different types of batteries, nickel cadmium or NICADs, as well as the lead acid batteries. We looked at the analog integrated circuit known as the op amp. And then we looked at also the MMIC, as well as the difference between CMOS and TTL ICs. We also looked at a type of integrated uh, circuit called memory. We discussed ROM, for instance, and we also had a look, a further look at what LEDs are and compared and contrast to LCDs or liquid, liquid crystal displays. And we ended up with connectors used in amateur radio. In terms of our curriculum, we are progressing quite nicely. So we are on practical circuits and we have all this way still to go, but we are making some good progress. Again, just a reminder of the practice exams that you can take to see how you are doing. So a Q&A from our last class, we had one question and one suggestion. So let's deal with the question. The, the question was, do the different colors of the LEDs indicate different values? Well, the color of the LED or the light that is emitted from the LED is really determined by the material that it's made of or the semiconductor material. However, the, vo the working voltage of the red, green, amber, and yellow LEDs are around 1.8 volts, which is the same. Uh, some people may say, but wait a minute, you know, there are some LEDs that have different colors as well. How is that achieved? Well, those are called multicolor LEDs, and they're usually more than one LED in one package. And a typical connection of multiple LEDs is called a reverse parallel. So on the right-hand side here, you will actually see that there are two LEDs, two diodes, uh, connected differently. So depending on how it's biased, if you put the positive on one leg and negative on the other leg, the forward bias LED will light up. If you reverse the polarity and you put the negative on the other lead and the positive on the other lead, the other LED conducts and the other one doesn't. So that one gives off light or it lights up. So that's how you have a multicolor LED. But to answer the question, as we understand it, uh, the color is really determined by the material or the semiconductor material really of the PN junction of the LED. So very good question indeed. There's some additional information here as well. In terms of the comment, so Franz did make a good comment where he said that uh, N-type connectors, even though we said that compared those are relatively um, uh, water resistant, certainly they're not by themselves waterproof, uh, he did make a comment that a good connector for outside use is called the 716th DIN connector. So on the right hand side here, you'll see it looks kind of similar to the end connector. Um, you see both the male and female 716th DIN connector that Franz was guiding us to. So another option for outdoor connections. And he made also a comment that if you have to use the end type, make sure that you crimp it only if you have the correct tool, right? Some very good advice. So we do have quite a few experienced amateurs in the class and we do value and appreciate their contributions and comments as well. So thanks so much, friends. All right, so we're moving right along. So we just updated a slide that was the last slide in the slide deck from last class to show what those connectors look like. So this is a duplicate of a previous slide with the connectors added. So for instance, when we said that for audio signals in amateur radio, the RCA phono jacks are popular, well, this is what the male RCA phono jack looks like. Some persons may say, hey, um, I've seen that before. Sometimes how I connect my VCR to a television or a cable box to a television when you use those types of connectors before HDMI. You'll be correct, it's those same connectors. 
uh, one video connector and one for left and right audio. So it's the same type of connector that's very popular for use in amateur radio when we're connecting audio frequencies. All right. So we have radio frequency connectors as well. And we are talking about the PL259 connectors, which is the male. So here on the right hand side, we have what that PL259 looks like. And we have the N-type connector. And on the right hand side here, there's the N-type male connector. So this is what it looks like. And we had the SMA connector, and this is what it looks like here on the right-hand side. Okay, so just a redo of the slide with the connectors, the picture of the connectors added. So again, we try to take abstract concepts and make it real so that we can see what we're looking at. And of course, when you see some of these connectors, you may say, but wait a minute, this looks quite familiar. I've used these, you know, I have a Wi-Fi device and maybe I'm using an SMA connector uh, to connect the antenna. So you'll be quite correct. They wouldn't be completely strangers to us. So we will now seek to go through the questions in the question pool from last class. Okay, so again, we dealt with all of this theory last session. So we will seek to quickly go through the questions so you can see what they look like. And you should see, uh, hopefully everyone who have either uh, remembered or reviewed last class. So all of this should be quite familiar. So we're doing the questions. These are the real questions in the exam and what the answer looks like. So let's go straight ahead. Questions and question pool. And just a reminder, in brackets, we have the question number. So if you're looking at the question pool and you want to see the entire question, including the distractors or the wrong answers, you simply search for this in the PDF, Control F to find, and you just plug this in and you'll go straight to that question. So you could see the full question, including the distractors. Okay. What are the stable operating points for a bipolar transistor used as a switch in a logic circuit? So again, last class, we did talk about that, that there are two characteristics um, that we need to be aware of for transistors or bipolar junction transistors. And they are the saturation and cutoff regions. So if you need any refreshers, just look at the slide deck or last class. So that's the answer for this question. Moving right along. Okay. Which element of a triode vacuum tube is used to regulate the flow of electrons between cathode and plate? So let's dissect this question a little bit. So what are they asking us about? They're asking us about which element, so or which part? Part of what? A triode vacuum tube. So remember last class we dealt with the triode vacuum tube, the parts of it. And they're asking what part is used to regulate the flow of electrons between what? The cathode and the plate. Well, there's only one other uh, connection to a triode. So therefore, that triode part is the control grid. Okay. Moving right along. What is the primary purpose of a screen grid in a vacuum tube? So if you recall last class, we did show that there was a regular screen grid. Um, and there was another type of screen grid as well, right? So the answer to that question, what's the primary purpose of the screen grid? It is to reduce the grid to plate capacitance. So that's the purpose of a screen grid compared to a regular grid. Remember we were saying that sometimes a component has stray or unwanted or parasitic values, and we did talk about parasitic capacitance. So to reduce that parasitic or stray capacitance or extra capacitance, we use a screen grid. Okay, next question in the question pool. What is an average of the low, sorry, I say again, what is an advantage of the low internal resistance of nickel cadmium batteries? So recall, we looked at batteries and we looked at the advantages and disadvantages and so on of the different types. Well, they're asking us about what, what is the advantage of having a low internal resistance of NICADs. And we, you may recall that we did make 
a reference to Ohm's law, the Ohm's law formula, and we showed that if the resistance is low, you can have a high current, or the current is high as a result of it having a low internal resistance. So the answer is high discharge current. Next question relating to batteries. What is the minimum allowable discharge voltage for maximum life of a standard 12 volt lead acid battery? Also something we discussed, but let's break this question down a bit. What they're asking us is for the minimum voltage. That's what they're asking us. The minimum allowable discharge voltage to attain maximum life of a standard 12 volt lead acid battery. So what they're asking us really is, what voltage do we not want that battery to fall below in order to maximize its life? Or what voltage, if we were to take it below that, it will reduce the life? What voltage is that? Again, we provided that in the last class. Minimum 10.5 volts. You do not want your regular lead acid battery voltage to drop below 10.5 volts. It will reduce the life. And that's your hard investment that you're talking about. So. Moving right along. Next question in the question pool. What kind of device is an integrated circuit operational amplifier, also called an op amp? So they're asking us what kind. So they're really asking us, is it an analog or a digital type of device? So we learned last class that op amps or the IC or the integrated circuit that is called an operational amplifier is indeed an analog device. It's as straightforward as that they're asking us the question. Okay, and here's just a simple, what, the, what do these letters mean? What is meant by the term MMIC? We learned that it meant monolithic microwave integrated circuit. That's what MMIC means. Next question in question pool. Which of the following is an advantage of CMOS integrated circuits compared to TTL integrated circuits? So we gave advantages and disadvantages between uh, the CMOS type of IC and the TTL type. So they're asking us which is an advantage. Well, one of the key advantages of CMOS versus TTL is its low power consumption. Okay, next question. What is meant by the term ROM, read-only memory? Learned that in the last class. We can probably recall that from our IT information technology classes at school. Next question in the question pool. What is meant when memory is characterized as non-volatile? So what they're asking us is, what does the term volatile mean when we refer to memory as being non-volatile? Well, it tells us that this information stored or the stored information is maintained even when power is removed. So it's non-volatile and therefore you unplug it, you switch it off and the information stays even though power is removed. That is called non-volatile memory. And ROM, or read-only memory, is a type of non-volatile memory. Okay, next question in the question pool. How is an LED biased when emitting light? So if you recall, we showed that an LED is really a diode, and it will conduct a current when it's forward biased. Positive to the positive plate, and negative to the ne negative LED. It's called forward biasing, as opposed to reverse bias. Okay. Next question in the question pool. Which of the following is a characteristic of a liquid crystal display? So we talked about LEDs and LCDs, and we noted last class that a liquid crystal display does not have any light of its own. It uses either the ambient light or some sort of backlighting. Right? So that's a characteristic of LCDs or liquid crystal displays. Next question, which of these connector types is commonly used for audio signals in amateur radio stations? So we did that last class on the slide deck, but we also quickly reviewed it today as well. So we 
are asking about connector types, but for what type of signal? Radio frequency signal? No. We are asking for audio signals or audio frequency signals or AF signals. What type of connector did we learn? We learned about the RCA phono connector or jack. Next question. Which of these connected types is commonly used for radio frequency connections at frequencies up to 150 megahertz? Again, we also dealt with that last class and the slide just at the beginning. We saw that the PL259 connector is good for up to 150 megahertz. Right. Next question. Which of the following describes an a type N connector, or sometimes called an N type connector. So we learned in the last class, it's described as a moisture resistant RF connector, and it's useful to 10 gigahertz. So that's the reason why we have those points in the slide deck, because you need to know it for the exam. Next question. What is a type SMA connector? We described that the last class also as a small threaded connector and it's suitable for signals up to several gigahertz. So note the difference between these types of connectors. So that's it for a question pool review from our last session. And we go now back into our slide deck. All right. So we're discussing power supplies. A power supply, because we're talking amateur radio, for instance, on your screen, this is a transceiver or a radio, and we need to power it somehow. We need to turn it on. We need to, for it to be able to receive, and in receiving it consumes power, and we need to also be able to transmit so that others will hear our signal, and that consumes power. Because when we transmit, that power is transferred to the antenna and goes out into free space and it's received by another amateur radio operator. But we have to power this device. And the device is powered via another device that's known as a power supply. So on the left hand side here, we have an example of a power supply. But it's also plugged into something. It's plugged into your wall outlet or what we refer to as the receptacle outlet. So you will have this on your wall at home. You plug the power supply in and you supply it with the 115 volts approximately, depending on where you are in the world, you may have a different supply voltage, and that converts it now into the supply that the radio requires. The radio, you cannot pl plug the radio usually straight into the wall outlet. That voltage is too high and it's also alternating current. The typical uh, voltage used by many amateur radio or general radio equipment will be 13.8 volts, or sometimes we call it 12 volts DC. So this power supply will take 115 volts AC in and send out 13.8 volts DC. So it basically converts AC into DC so that it can supply the equipment. So that's a power supply. And I have a diagram here. You would have seen this before in the technician class. You have the AC and then it goes through a rectifier. So you get pulsing DC. And this is actually a full wave rectification or a bridge rectification, which we'll come up to. So you're seeing all of the pulses here, and then we filter it out using capacitors and inductors. We'll come to that also, and notice the pulsing DC now is a little bit smoothed, and then we apply something else called a voltage regulator, and you get a nice steady DC. So that's what a power supply basically will do. This block diagram here is, it will take the AC and end up with DC on the outside. So we say that power supplies convert AC line power to DC voltages. Now, there are two types of power supplies that we need to be concerned with, two general types. The linear type and the switching type, also sometimes called switch mode. So these are the two types of power supplies. But what's the difference between them? So first of all, a linear power supply uses a transformer. So we did transformer. So you'll start to see that we're actually coming together with the various components that we learned during the course so far. You may be wondering, why were we studying transformers and rectifiers and capacitors and inductors? Well, it's hopefully now coming together to show where these components work inside of devices. So a lot of the components that we talked about, resistors, capacitors, and the like, 
you will see that there are parts inside of our power supply. So we are just making it real here by showing you the symbol and the uh, picture of what it looks like to refresh your memory from the technician class what all of these things look like. And even somewhere in the general class, we dealt with some of these components as well. So a linear power supply uses a transformer. And what does a transformer do? It usually steps down, in our case, the AC voltage. It also uses something called a rectifier. And what does the rectifier do? The rectifier converts AC to DC. But there are three different types of rectifiers that we need to encounter. The first one is the half-wave rectifier. And that only deals with half of the AC signal or 180 degrees. And it uses essentially a diode and it rectifies that AC into pulsing DC. Then we have the full wave rectifier, which does the full cycle or 360 degrees. And that uses two diodes and we get also pulsing DC, but all of it is pulsed. We don't lose half of the signal let's say as the half wave does. And then we have something called the bridge rectifier, which does the same thing. It also rectifies the full signal or 360 degrees. And this is what a bridge rectifier looks like. This is the symbol here. Notice it's comprised of four diodes. And therefore, it also does the same thing as the full wave as far as rectification. How it's connected, however, is different. And we'll show that in a, another slide. And also inside of that linear power supply, you also have capacitors and inductors. And those components smooth the DC output. So all of these components come together in a power supply to convert AC line power to DC. And the other type we said, of course, we had the switching power supply as well. And we'll come to a slide with a bit more detail. So again, two types of power supplies that you need to know about, the linear power supply and the switching power supply. Oh, on the right hand side, we show an example of what a linear power supply looks like and a switching or switch mode power supply. And we're saying note the size difference. A linear pound for pound or for the same output tends to be a bit larger and heavier. Why? Because it uses a transformer, a bulky transformer. Whereas the switching uh, power supply tends to be a little more compact. We talked about rectifiers in the previous slide. We said that, you know, there are rectifiers, half-wave, full-wave bridge. So we want to go a little more in detail as to what those are. So we'll have an understanding of the differences. So we said the rectifiers take the AC and convert it into DC. That's what we said the rectifier is doing. All right, so after the transformer breaks down the voltage, we have the half-wave. We said it's only rectifying half. So if we take a look on the right-hand side here, you have the AC line power. It's down converted via a transformer, but it's still AC when it passes through the transformer. We want to get it to DC, to power equipment. So if we pass it through a half-wave rectifier, notice in the right-hand side, you just have these little blips, but there's a space between the blips. That is half-wave rectification. We are only getting half of the signal. Notice the bottom part, it's gone. Notice we have the top part, the bottom part, the top part, the bottom part. When we pass it through a half-wave rectifier, it's doing a half-way job. It's only giving us half of the output. But it is still giving us rectification. It's still giving us DC, pulsing DC. But if we were to look at a full-wave rectifier, somebody who does a full job, not a half-way job, we have the AC coming out of the transformer, and then we're passing it through the full-wave rectification. Notice, notice the difference. We still have the little blips. But notice it's not wasting any of the blips. It's converting all of this AC line power. So it's going up, coming down, and it goes right back up and come down. So it doesn't waste any of it. It's doing a good job taking all of this AC and converting all of it into DC because it's a full wave rectifier. And the bridge rectifier actually does the same thing. The difference is how it's connected to the transformer. So we say that half wave rectifiers only does half of the cycle. The advantage is very simple and cheap in that it uses a single diode. But there's a major disadvantage. You're wasting half of the AC power. Yeah? So sometimes we go for cheap, but we waste. So note the advantage and the disadvantage of a half-wave rectifier. And as we said, a full-wave rectifier does the full or 360 degrees of the cycle. All right? It's like a whole circle. The advantage is it converts the entire AC power available. It doesn't waste any like Mr. Half-Wave, who does a half-wave job. The full-wave does a full job. Disadvantage, well, I guess you could see a disadvantage in a way. It uses two diodes, so it's a little more expensive. 
And it also requires what we call a center tap transformer. So on the right-hand side here, we have a little diagram to show you where the transformer on the output side is center tapped. It doesn't have two, le two legs, as we were looking at before, it has three legs. So to do full wave rectification using two diodes, you need to have a center tapped transformer. So we go now to the bridge rectifier. And remember, we said the bridge rectifier also does a full job. It doesn't do a halfway job. It does the 360 degrees of the cycle. The advantage is it does not need a center tap transformer. A regular transformer with two leads will be just fine. Uh, disadvantage, however, it uses four diodes. And we show you what a bridge rectifier looks like. Notice the four pins of it. And notice the, di the symbol or the diagram for the bridge rectifier actually shows four diodes. Right. So this is a bit of detail on the three different types of rectification, half wave, full wave, and bridge. And just a little bit of extra information for your reference, you know, um, on the left hand side here will be what a half wave rectification circuit is. Notice there's just uh, one diode inside of there. The center tap uh, full wave rectifier. Notice we have the two diodes inside of there as well, but it's a center tap transformer. And then on this side here, there's no center tap. You use the bridge rectifier. Notice there are four diodes in a bridge rectifier. So this is just if you want to compare and contrast or have the hierarchy of the different types of rectification. Half wave, full wave. And for full wave, you have the center tapped, or what we'll just simply call a full wave rectifier. And then we have the bridge rectifier. All right, so a little more on rectifier circuits. So remember we said we take the input voltage, which is AC, we use the rectifier to convert it into pulsing DC. Now we say here that the output of an unfiltered rectifier circuit is a series of DC pulses. So we saw that. We noticed even after we pass through the rectifier, it is DC, yes, but it's pulsing DC. It's not steady. And what we need to know, there's a difference between half-wave rectification and full-wave rectification also. Half-wave, the frequency is the same as the AC input. But for full-wave, the output frequency is twice. How do we figure that out? Notice we have the AC frequency here. But because half-wave only gets half of it, it's the same. We're just looking here at the top, the peaks of it. So the frequency is blip, space, blip, space, and so on. So therefore, the full wave rectification does a good job of taking both sides of the cycle. It takes the one that the half wave wastes, and therefore you're getting double dip. So that's why the frequency will be twice that of the input frequency uh, by the AC, and also be twice that of the half wave. So for the exam, we need to know that, that the half wave, the frequency of the pulses are the same, for the AC input and for the full wave rectifier, the output frequency is twice. So in terms of the whole power supply, so the whole power supply you have, it's plugged into the AC outlet. There's a transformer of some type. It goes into some sort of rectification. And after the rectifier, it goes now to start to smoothen the output. And to smoothen the output, we will have other components as well, all right? So we will typically have inductors and capacitors and so on. And on the output side, notice we will have DC output coming in, uh, coming on the output side, the AC input goes to DC on the output. That's the purpose of a power supply. What we need to be aware of also inside of the power supply, we have capacitors and inductors as well. So after the rectifier stage, and let's just go back here. So after the rectifier stage, we have a filter stage. So this is AC coming in. The rectifier turns it into pulsing DC. And then we have a filter stage that, you know, smoothens, smoothens it a little bit, takes out the AC component of it. So the output of the rectifier circuit uh, connects to a filter. And that is made up of capacitors and inductors. So right after the rectifier, you have the filter stage. So here we are. So you have the rectifier going to a filter. And inside of the filter are capacitors and inductors. Remember we had said when we were using the water circuit analogy, we said that the inductor and the capacitors act like the pressure tank in your water system. Remember you don't want your 
uh, your pump going on, off, on, off all the time. It holds a bit of the charge. That's exactly what the filter circuit does so that it tends to smoothen it a bit. So therefore, the output of a rectifier connects to a filter and that filter is made up of capacitors and inductors. The purpose of the filter is to filter out the AC component of the pulsed DC and output a steady or relatively steady DC voltage. That's the purpose of the filter. So those are the various stages of a power supply. You have the rectifier stage and you have the filter stage. There's also something called a bleed resistor that is often found across the output of a power supply. So you need to know that the bleed resistor there is a purpose of that. That is to discharge or to bleed off any charge on a filter capacitor when the power supply is off. If you don't do that, you, you may switch off the power supply and that capacitor may still hold a charge and that may be unwanted. Somebody may short circuit uh, the terminals of the power supply, the output, and you may get a zap. So the bleed resistor is to discharge the output voltage uh, that would otherwise have a voltage from the capacitor inductor combination. The value of this resistor is normally very high. Why is it normally very high? Well, during regular use, you do not want much current flowing through that resistor. Otherwise, it'll be wasteful. You want your power supply to supply your radio or your circuit. So you don't want that resistor to be taking up a lot of that power or that current. You want it to be very little. So during normal operations, that bleed resistor doesn't really have a significant impact. It doesn't cause your power supply to be inefficient. But when you're not using the power supply and it's switched off, guess what? It will bleed off whatever energy is contained in the power supply. Even though it's off, the capacitor holds a charge that could be dangerous to you. Somebody servicing the power supply may go in and uh, may use a screwdriver and it may con con contact the positive and negative terminals or the ground and it may cause a spark. So that's the reason you have a bleed resistor in your power supply. So at this time, we will now take a short two minute break. So please uh, take a stretch, have some water, take a bathroom break and meet you back shortly.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. So we continue. Now we had discussed the linear power supply before, and we now come, we had said there were two types of power supplies or two categories of power supplies. We said we had a linear power supply and we have the switching power supply. So we are now discussing the switching power supply. On the right hand side, again, we reproduce the diagram shows an example of a linear power supply and the switching power supply. The switching power supply is also sometimes referred to as the switched mode power supply. So in your question in the question pool, they may talk about a switched mode power supply. It's the same thing as a switching power supply, just another term, similar term, to refer to the same type of power supply. But switching power supplies, when we compare them to linear power supplies, are smaller and lighter. So we mentioned that before. Notice how much bigger the linear power supply is to the switching power supply. The linear power supply is heavier, it's bulkier, uh, and it's bigger. So those are the points that you need to learn for the exam, that a switching power supply tends to be smaller and lighter. But there are reasons as well. You don't necessarily need to know the reason too much, but just to let you know. The first one here is that there's no transformer in the switch mode power supply. And on the right hand side here, at or the bottom, we just have a circuit diagram of a switching power supply to show that there's no transformer, right? Breaking down AC voltage to DC. It's all electronics inside of here. So that's one of the reasons why it tends to be smaller for the same capacity type power supply. There's no transformer, so it's not as heavy or big as, and bulkier. But it uses a high frequency operation, and that is what allows for the use of smaller components inside of the power supply. So you need to re remember this for the exam. Switch mode power supplies or switching power supplies are smaller and lighter for the similar linear power supply. And uh, note that the circuits in switching power supplies are much more complex than linear power supplies because they use all sorts of electronic components compared to the linear power supply, which tends to be simpler. So we now come to talk a bit about schematic diagrams. So throughout the entire course work, uh, from the technician level going into the general, we have been talking about circuits and circuit diagrams sometimes also referred to as schematic diagrams. And schematic diagrams are used by us as amateur radio operators to describe circuits. And we typically use them when we either creating or designing a new circuit, or if we are troubleshooting some sort of issue that we have with our radio. So we tend to use schematic diagrams for that purpose. And there are various symbols on the schematic diagrams and each symbol will represent a different component. And this is, again, another slide that brings together a lot of what we have already done in the technician level and what we have discussed quite a bit over the past few sessions in the general class, which is the various components. And in your exam, you're going to get asked a question. You'll get a diagram like this, and you'll see, tell me what is object or symbol number five? What is symbol number one, and so on. So for instance, on this diagram, and these are actual questions in the question pool, they will ask you, what does symbol one represent? So let's look at symbol one. Notice there's a one next to the diagram, in the circuit diagram, the component. So they're referring to, when you see a number next to it, it's, ne it's, it's closest to the component. It's that component that you're talking about. So what type of component is this as number one highlighted? It's an FET or FET or field effect transistor. We would have learned this previously. Nothing new really here. So this is just bringing together our previous theories. When we see the symbol, we need to recognize it and say, hey, that's a FET. I know that's, you know, great so gate source drain. I know that symbol. I, I know it quite well. Well, they ask us symbol number two. What is symbol number two? Let's look at our trusty circuit diagram. And there is a number two, and therefore it's referring to this. What is this? This is the symbol of a transistor. Notice here, NPN junction transistor. There's also another one called a PNP. Uh, PNP is where the arrow is reversed. It's going inward. So this is an NPN junction transistor. 
And if you look at the diagram, there's only one such transistor. So that's what it is, a transistor. Let's go to symbol number five. What is symbol number five? Symbol number five, we kind of looked at it in one of the slides, just skimmed over it quickly. Uh, it's a diode, we know. We know the symbol for a diode. And it has the little, well, it looks like a Z, doesn't it? So this is a Zener diode. So when you see the symbol, it means a Zener diode. Symbol number six. What is symbol number six? Let's look at it here. Well, we know this to be a transformer, but what type? A solid core transformer, as opposed to another type. Remember, we had a diagram that showed the different types of transformers? Well, this symbol here is a solid core transformer. What about symbol number seven? Okay, symbol number seven, you see, but wait a minute, that looks like an inductor. You'll be correct, it's an inductor, but it's a tapped inductor because there's a connection midway through the inductor. So that's called a tapped inductor, similar to how we have sent a tapped transformers uh, earlier when we talked about uh, using full, uh, full wave rectification. Well, that's the same concept. We are tapping it. We are making a connection. We're making a tap into the middle of the component. So it's a tapped inductor. And there are others as well. Um, so let me just ask a, a poll question for persons to put in the chat box. There's a symbol here. I'm just wondering if anybody recognizes or knows what the symbol is here. It's unusual. We haven't come across it before, I think, in the class, neither the technician or the general. Symbol number four. Anyone who knows, let's see, what symbol is that? If you can pop it into the chat. Anyone who knows. So, yeah, 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 right? Very good. So that's one of the terms that it's called um, tunnel diode. It's also called a varactor diode. And what is a varactor diode? Very good there, Ramzan, excellent. Very well. So you're quite correct. So a varactor diode, what that does, it's a diode, but it's a voltage control capacitor. It changes uh, the capacitance based on a voltage. So, Varactor, yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Franz. Uh, you're quite correct as well. So quite a few people in the class knows what this symbol is, and you're quite all quite correct, a Varactor diode. Uh, we don't need to know it yet, but just, um, you know, we like to give something extra in the class, and of course, we have potentiometers or variable resistors, uh, capacitors, um, diodes, um, and of course, what you call chassis ground and voltage supply. So a lot of other things on the diagram that's not part of the question pool. But we are doing electronics as part of this, and therefore we need to look at it holistically. All of these discrete components or individual components that we've been talking about throughout our entire sessions are coming together now in a circuit diagram. So now when you look at a circuit diagram, you look for the components, you do identify and say, hey, that's a Zener diode. Hey, that's a transistor. Hey, that's a FET, and so on and so on. And then all of a sudden now, you start to realize, but wait a minute, this is what a FET does. This is what an inductor does. This is what a transformer does, and so on. And the circuit diagram will start to make sense. Excellent indeed, okay. So we now go on to digital circuits. So when we talk about digital circuits, we are talking about a circuit in which we are referring to two separate values or two separate voltages. And we say one voltage or one representation is on and the other one is off. We can also say it's high or it's low. And another way to represent it is to say it's a one or it's a zero. So either of these three representations are quite valid when we are talking about digital circuits. Something is either on or off. So your light switch, for instance, that you turn on your, um, let's say the chandelier, you switch it on, it's on. You switch it off, it's off. It only has two states. So you could think of your light switch as a digital toggle. It's on or off. Also, digital circuits use the binary system or the binary number system. And it is because in the binary number system, each digit is either a one or a zero. There's nothing larger than a one. There's either a zero or a one. So you have a, could have a very large number, 
but it's all consisting of ones and zeros. There's no two and three and four and five. The decimal number system that we use is uh, you have zero all the way through nine, but for the binary number system, it's either a one or a zero. When you carry, you go and you shift and you use either a one or a zero. When you're increasing that number, there's no two and three that you can use, all right? Um, okay, so we also note that digital circuits are used to implement logic functions. And a circuit that implements logic functions is called a gate. All right, so bear that in mind in terms of what a, a gate is. A gate is simply a circuit that implements some logic function. Let's go into a bit what logic functions are. So there are two typical logic functions that we will deal with at this level in the course. Uh, we will present a slide with some more logic functions, but right now we are only talking about two of them, the AND and the NOR. But what is the AND? The AND is a circuit where you have two inputs and the output is one only when both are one. So here's how I like to think of that. I have two hands. I have a Zaboka in one hand and for persons outside of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, we call those avocados, I suppose. So you have an avocado in your left hand, you have an avocado in your right hand and then you have your mouth. So the, your left hand and your right hand are the inputs and your mouth is the output. So if you only have one avocado in your left hand, your mouth remains closed. You do not see anything. However, if you have an avocado in your right hand only, your mouth still remains closed. The only time you open your mouth is when you have an avocado in each of your hands. So your left hand has an avocado and your right hand has an avocado and then your mouth opens. So that is the example of an AND gate or the AND logic function. The output is one only when both inputs are one. So when your hands are full, your left hand is full with an avocado and your right hand is full with an avocado, your mouth opens. If you only have one in either hands, your mouth stays shut and that is exactly what the AND logic function or the AND gate is. And on the right hand side here, we have what we call a truth table. So here's a symbol for the AND gate. You notice you have two inputs, like your left hand and your right hand, and you have one output, like your mouth. If you have zero avocados uh, on your left hand and zero avocados on your right hand, your mouth remains closed. It's zero. If you have an avocado on your left hand, but no avocado on your right hand, it's still closed. If you have no avocado on your left hand and one avocado on your right hand, it is still closed. But if you have an avocado in your left hand and an avocado in your right hand, guess what? Your mouth opens. So therefore, you only open your mouth when you have an avocado in each hand. And it's the same thing with the AND gate. When the input one is one and the input two is one, you get an output of one. Any other combination of the values, your output is zero. Your mouth stays closed, All right? So that's the AND gate. That is how the AND gate functions. But the other gate that we are looking at here is called the NOR gate or the NOT OR gate. The NOR gate. This is a symbol for the NOR gate. You have a NOT gate. You have a NOT and you have the OR gate here. So this is called a NOR gate. Notice you have two inputs as well, left hand and right hand, and you have one output. But the opposite is true here now. The only time your mouth opens is when you have no avocados in either hand. So you have no avocados in your left hand, no avocados in your right hand, your mouth stays open. But as soon as you put an avocado in any hand, so you have one avocado in your left hand, your mouth closes. Doesn't matter what your right hand has, one. Once you have an avocado in either hand, your mouth closes, all right? So if you have no avocado in your left hand, but you have an avocado in your right hand, your mouth stays closed. If you have an avocado in your both hands, your mouth also stays closed. The only time you have an avocado, sorry, you your mouth opens is when you have no avocados. So it's exactly the opposite of the AND gate. So the NOR gate operates opposite to the AND gate. And that's why we say here for the NOR gate, the output is one only when both inputs are zero. Your mouth is open only when you have no avocados at all. 
So again, a little something extra. You don't need to know this for your exam, but we have been talking about the AND gate here, and we have been talking about the NOR gate. But there's also the NOT gate, the AND gate. Uh, well, we dealt with the AND gate. There's the NAND gate. There's the OR gate. There's the exclusive OR or the XOR gate, and so on and so on. And you have the symbols for the gates and the various truth tables. If anybody's interested to know beyond the... Uh, what we did just now, which is the AND gate and the NOR gate. We did this one, AND gate, this one, and the NOR gate. We have other types of gates for you to read at your leisure. So, of course, we have integrated circuits that can provide much more complex logic than just one gate. But like everything else, you know, we have building blocks. And in an integrated circuit, we can utilize multiple gates by combining them into one package. And there are three different types of logic circuits that we need to know for our amateur radio general class. The first one is called flip-flops. And no, we're not talking about the slippers. We're talking about an electronic circuit called the flip-flop. The other one is called a counter. And the third one is called shift registers. So the flip-flop, there are different types of flip-flops. Flip so those who are already studying electronics may recall the SR flip-flop, the JK flip-flop, the D and the T flip-flops. So there are several types. But a flip-flop is essentially a circuit with two states or two stable states. And it can be used to store binary data. That is either a 1 or a 0. And the data that is inside of there, you can change it by adjusting the inputs. So those are called flip-flops. Counters, on the other hand, will count what your input pulses are. So you have input pulses, and it will output, uh, the output of that counter is the count in binary. So that's what a counter uh, logic circuit is. And then there are shift registers. Well, we have a little more to say about shift registers in another, another slide coming up. But for now, we'll just say that a shift register is what we call a clocked array of flip-flops but the outputs are connected to the input of the next flip-flop. That's why we say it's an array. So you have multiple flip-flops. The output of one is connected to the input of the other, sort of daisy chain or chain as they say, and it passes data in steps along the, the array. And when the shift register receives a clock pulse, it shifts the data further down the array. And again, we'll come back to shift registers in a slide in a bit, a bit and deal with a little more detail of the shift register. So we did say we have different types of flip-flops, J, K, S, R, T, and D. But the one that we need to know about for our general class is called the D flip-flop. So you don't need to know the diagram necessarily, but this is what a D flip-flop looks like. If you notice, you see some NAND gates and you'll have a NOT gate and so on, different types of gates connected crisscrossed. And you have the input, you have a clock, and then you have the output. Notice that for a D flip-flop, the output, which is Q, Q is your output. It will change every time you get a clock pulse. So once you get an input on the clock line, Q will change. All right, that's why we say it's a flip-flop. It flips and flops. Uh, it's kind of like some people, you know, you push them and they change their mind. You push them again, they change their mind again. You know, sometimes we call people like that bandwagonists. So you could think of a flip-flop like a bandwagonist, you know, you're Sun o'clock signal changes his mind. So that's why we say here that a flip-flop is a circuit whose output, Q, changes when it receives the clock pulse, CLK. So you supply a signal to clock, Q flips on you, it changes its mind. Notice there's something called Cuba. And Cuba, not the country Cuba, Cuba is, uh, whenever Q changes, Cuba is actually the inverse or you could say the opposite, the inverse of Q. So whatever Q is, uh, has in it, Q bar is the inverse or the opposite. So that's what a D flip-flop is, and we will actually use D flip-flops in another type of circuit shortly. So this is what you need to know for your exam, that a, a D flip-flop is one that the output changes when you get a clock pulse. And also, after the clock pulse is obtained, Q changes, it's equal to D, and Q bar becomes the opposite or the inverse of Q. So Q is not equal to Q bar, it's the opposite. All right, 
So why we needed to know about the D flip-flops is that when we connect three D flip-flops in a daisy chain, we get a three-bit counter. And this is a question in the question pool in the exam. So we say that a three-bit binary counter is made up of three D flip-flops. Uh, and we also need to know, so for example, let's, let's deal with the first bullet point. So notice this is the first D flip-flop. It's daisy changed to the second D flip-flop is daisy chain to the third D flip-flop, and you have the outputs from the flip-flop. So you have the input, and you have the output. And of course, these flip-flops can go up or down. For those of you who are, of course, more advanced in electronics, yes, they are up and down counters. And we also need to note that for a three-bit counter, we can have eight different states. And these are the different states, whether it's up or down. So let's go to the eight different states. Because a three-bit counter has three values, the A value, the B value, or the C value, right? The Q, or we could call it QA, QB, and QC. You have three values, and these are the three, these are the possible values that can go in the air. It could be zero, zero, zero. The next could be zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. And if you were checking while I was calling all those values, you will notice that there are, are actually eight of them. So these are the values here I was calling out. Zero, zero, zero. So this first zero is QA. This second zero is QB. This third zero is the output of QC. And when you apply um, a shift, you go to zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So these are the values, and notice there are eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's how we get to this statement that a three-bit binary counter can have eight different states. And there's a truth table on the right-hand side here that shows that for anyone who would like to look at it and convince themselves. And we, of course, have the count-up mode and we have the countdown mode. So eight different states, 000, 001, all the way to 111. Eight different states that this three-bit counter could be uh, right. And of course, we have shift registers. So remember, we said that there were three different types of logic circuits that we were going to deal with, flip-flops, counters, and shift registers. Well, our last one for tonight is the shift register. And we did say, this is repeated, that a shift register is a clocked array of flip-flops. So, here are the flip-flops, first flip-flop, second flip-flop, sec third flip-flop. They are clocked, meaning they have that clock signal going to all three flip-flops. They are an array, so you have them daisy-chained. You have the first flip-flop going into the second flip-flop, going into the third flip-flop. So that's why we say shift registers are clocked array of flip-flops. Look at it, and that is what it means. And the outputs of each flip-flop, so this is a flip-flop. This one is the second flip-flop. This is the third flip-flop. The outputs here becomes the input of the next flip-flop. So whatever you put in here, you have an output. The output becomes the input from the next flip-flop. The output from this flip-flop, the second flip-flop, becomes the input for the third flip-flop. That's how it goes. We call that daisy chaining or we have an array. And it passes data in steps along the array. Remember, it's kind of like uh, passing the buck uh, to the next person or shifting blame something we might be quite familiar with. So if we con consider that uh, concept of passing the buck or shifting the blame, that's what a shift register does. So maybe there are some people you know like that. And when the shift register receives a clock pulse, data is shifted. So we send a clock pulse into the array and what it does, it shifts the value. So let's get to what we mean by that. So let us say the values, this, let's say the value starts off Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. 1, 0, 0, 0. Let's say this was the first set of values in your flip-flop, sorry, in your shift register. When you apply a clock pulse, guess what? The one that was here goes to Q2. Notice that? And when you apply another clock pulse, you give a signal to the clock pulse pin. That one goes from Q2 to Q3 and so on and so on. And that's what we mean by a shift register. As we apply that clock pulse, that value shifts, shifts down uh, to the next one in the array. So that's why we say when a shift register receives a clock pulse, 
data is shifted down the array. So that's, that brings us to the end of our theory for this evening. I'd just like to remind everyone of the virtual panel discussion that takes place tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. All persons are invited. The link is panel.ttreact.com. And the, and the topic of tomorrow's virtual panel discussion is the role of radio communications in disaster prevention and preparedness. We have a very nice lineup of speakers tomorrow, so we invite each and every one to join. Please feel free to invite a friend or colleague, anyone that will be interested. This is in collaboration with several stakeholders as part of both REACT Month as well as the National Disaster Prevention and Preparedness Month. Uh, declared in Trinidad and Tobago and being held by the ODPM. Also, just to clarify, persons have been asking about the Zello channels. Well, we do have two Zello channels. One is called React Members. There's a space in that channel name, and the other one is called React Members, but there's no space. So here are the links if you want quick links to the Zello channels. And note that when you're adding any of the channels, be sure to add a channel and not a user. Right, so that's one of the challenges that persons may have. They said, I'm adding myself, I'm adding the channel, but it says I'm not approved. If you see that, it's most likely you're adding a user. So what you need to make sure is that you're adding a channel, okay? Certainly, uh, please continue reviewing the technician class material for anyone who has uh, not yet completed that review. Um, also, just to note that in Trinidad and Tobago, our COVID-19 cases continue to be high and we're still under a state of emergency with a curfew. So everyone in TNT, be safe out there. I believe there's some level of restrictions, quite a few islands of the Caribbean as well, as well as um, other places around the world. Um, May is React Month. It continues to be. We're coming to the end of it. May is also at the NDPPM in TNT. And of course, we just mentioned the virtual panel discussion. Everyone is invited. Here's the link again, panel.ttreact.com. Our next session, God's willing, will be next week, Friday. I hope I got the date correct. Friday, the 4th of June, 2021, 8.30 p.m. So everyone, please be safe. Take good care. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Okay, hi, Natasha. Good night, all the best. Bob, good night as well. Okay, Adish, evening. Mark, take good care. Kevin, hi. Hi, Marissa. Good night. Good night, Larry. No problem to all your friends. Um, know you're quite busy and so on. Glad you were able to make it. Okay, Ramzan, yeah, man. And Adish, yeah, all the best. <laughs> All right, I'll, avocado and farine. I love that there, uh, uh, friends. Okay. Yes, Adish, good point. <laughs> no, no, no means, yeah, okay. Cool, all right. Adam, LOL as well. Sure, you're welcome, Larry. You take good care also, Adish. Thanks a lot, really appreciate the encouragement and you being here um, every week there, friends. All the best to you and yours too. We'll pass on the message. Gary, have a good night. Take good care. Hi, Desi. Have a good night. Anthony, good night as well. George, all the best. You too. Be safe. We'll try to get some good sleep too. You too. Sylvester, have a good night too, man. Take care. Hi, right, Ramzan. Have a good one. June, you blessings as well. Thanks very much. Larry, have a good night. Paula, you too. Have a good night. Good rest. You all certainly welcome there, Charlene. You too have a great week, uh, great weekend and yeah, R&R, most important. <laughs> Got you there, friends. Take good care. All right, Kevin. January, have a good night as well. Okay, Balchan, thanks a lot. Great to see you there, man. Take good care. Uh, Jessica, have a good night also. Yeah, be safe. 